everyone to the Wednesday night um, Bible class and devotional. I have a, a, both the devotional and the uh, class. <clears throat> but we read in Psalms, the uh, first chapter, the very first Psalm, verses 1 through 3, <clears throat> We read of a man that is blessed. And it's certainly a, a desirable thing to, to want to be blessed for the Lord. So it's uh, profitable to us to consider this man who is blessed. <clears throat> First, uh, let us consider the meaning of the word blessed in this passage, since the word blessed has wide ranging use in Scripture. We will not examine all the different uses of the word blessed or blessed, but only as it pertains to these verses. <clears throat> the Hebrew word pronounced esher is a masculine noun meaning a person's state of bliss or happiness. The word is always used to refer to people and is never used of God. <clears throat> to be blessed, man must do something. Uh, usually this is positive, but in the selection and the consideration it is negative. <clears throat> a blessed man, for example, is one who trusts in God without equivocation. He might uh, refer to Psalms, uh, uh, Second Psalm, verse 12, 34th Psalm, verse 9, 40th Psalm, verse 5, 84th Psalm, verse 6, 84th Psalm, verse 13, and 146th Psalm, verse 5, and, and also Proverbs 16, 20. You can look those up on your own. A blessed man is one who comes under the authorities, authority of God's revelation. And of course, uh, at the time of the writing, uh, this Psalm, is, it was the Torah. In Psalm 119, verse 1, we we see that Psalms, uh, the first Psalm, verse 2, which we are considering tonight. Uh, Proverbs 29, verse 18. And this is word in, in Proverbs 16, verse 20, his commandment in Psalms 112, verse 1. His testimony in Psalms 119, verse 2. His way in Psalms 128, verse 1, and Proverbs 8:32. The man who is beneficent to the poor is blessed. Psalms 41, verse 2, and Proverbs 14, verse 21. Then there is the uh, negative approach of Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who does not. He isolates himself and shuns the company of certain people, that is, the ungodly. The psalm ends by noting that it is precisely these ungodly men who will, in the end, be isolated. They will not stand in the judgment. <clears throat> they will be conspicuous by their absence, or they will perish. Now, why is this word uh, never used in reference? God. Well, simply stated, there is nothing God must do to achieve a state of bliss or happiness. God is not man, and there are no grounds for God to aspire to man's state or desires, even in a wishful, wishful way. God does not envy man, never desires something man is or has, which God does not have, but would like to have. <clears throat> With that in mind, let's read the uh, first three verses of the uh, first psalm. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, who, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. 
the uh, uh, simplest definition I guess we can uh, give to the word blessed is that of bliss or happiness. Now, I don't think this definition would uh, be far off the mark since every man is seeking after happiness. The prescription to the attainment of bliss set forth in the psalm is certainly not the only way that that man may attain a, a state of bliss, but it is a necessary inclusion in such attainment. <clears throat> it is no wonder that this psalm begins the, the uh, great book of which this is a part, and it is no wonder that the very first word of this psalm and the entire book is blessed. For this directs us to uh, where happiness is to be found, in its highest degree and purest form. Blessed, says David, is such and such a man. And the word he, that he uses is, <clears throat> in the original, exceedingly expressive. In the Hebrew, it is a, a particle interjection, if you want to look that up, uh, which gives it a, a very unusual etymology. So the word can be used as an adjective, a noun, or an interge interjection. It is likely constructed from both a noun and verb and is exclamatory in its force. So, who is this blessed man? <clears throat> now, the description given of him is simply that he is a man. There are moral qualities given, but the thing said of him is that he is a man. There is nothing that is extraordinary about him or that distinguishes him from any other man. This is a characteristic that is common to us all. Although we are not all men, like all humanity, this one man representatively is subject to the common sorrows of humanity. If we know or hear of a person greatly blessed by God, that is, happy, happy in his uh, walk in holiness and service to Christ, we may fool ourselves in the delusion that he must have been better than the ordinary man, certainly better situated than such a one as ourselves. Uh, but we are mistaken in such a determination. God fashions all hearts alike. And if there are distinct distinctions, they are not a result of any predetermined quality or advantage. Certainly there are advantages that derive from external circumstances, such as a place of birth or wealth of parents. But the individual is not excluded thereby from the adversities that commonly preys upon man. The most blessed man is still a man. He must suffer pain, or waste away in sickness, endure losses and crosses, and yet in it all be a blessed man. Being a man, he is also subject to weaknesses in character, perhaps of a quick temper or of an imperious spirit. He may be tempted to slothfulness or sin of another kind. Being a man, sane or sinner, he is a blessed man, for he has available uh, to himself the gospel, God's power to save. Jesus died for sinners and saves saints. While abiding in this tabernacle of flesh, he may have some debilitating infirmity, and yet, nonetheless, he is blessed. The best of men that we can envision is not without fault. Such a man likely will readily confess to you that he must wrestle still with the temptations of sin, the very same temptations that we have, yet who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Although that may be the case, he must often endure the counsel of the ungodly, the path of the sinners often crosses his way, and the seat of the scornful is sometimes next door, sometimes under the same roof. This blessed man is subject to like passions 
and tempted in all points as we are. And yet he is blessed, and so may we. Had God not blessed him, he would be only a man, having no hope of eternal happiness. <clears throat> Observe, too, that his blessings were a result of his having avoided something that was contrary to the nature of God and not because he had some eminent position. It is, blessed is the king, blessed is the common, blessed is the scholar, blessed is the tradesman, blessed is the rich, blessed is the poor, blessed is the famous, blessed is the obscure. In as simple a phrase as possible, it is, Blessed is the man. This blessedness comes to any person who loves God and obeys Him. His position or standing in society has nothing to do with it. His character has everything to do with it. He is a man and nothing but a man. And it is through the grace of God, through the blood of Christ, that makes him much more. This blessed man is likened to a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. Jesus informed the water of the woman by the well that he was the living water, which if one drinks will never thirst again. The blessed man cannot live to himself. He must imbibe upon the living water. In verse 6, it is written that the Lord knows the way of the righteous, implying that God's approval of his ways if his way brings him strength. The best of men cannot live acceptably before God, dependent solely on their own devices, but through God working in them. As Paul wrote in Philippians, the second chapter, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. <clears throat> Nature abhors a vacuum, and so does man. In ourselves, we are as weak as we can be and left our own devices, we would soon fall into some sin, <clears throat> whatever the, it may be. There is in the psalm, however, one word which dis uh, truly describes this man, and that is that he is a righteous man. <clears throat> Observe the uh, last verse. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. This man has readjusted his will by that of the divine will. He was once all out of harmony. He put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. But now his judgment is rectified and in obedience, spirit, and character. Uh, he is a righteous man. We all were naked and defiled, but we have been washed in the cleansing blood of the Lamb, and clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven, 2 Corinthians 5, chapter verse 2. This is the description of a blessed man, but still, remember, he is only a man. Some were born in the lowliest paths of life and educated in only the basics of a formal education. Yet some have been among the finest soldiers of the cross and most heroic servants for their Lord. The brightest and most glorious of us are but sons and daughters of Adam. Ezekiel, uh, privileged to see more visions perhaps than any of the prophets, is constantly called son of man. In fact, he's called that more often than was Christ. And maybe that's, the, you know, God would try to keep him humble. Jesus was referred to as the Son of Man in recognition that he was as much a man as anyone could be. The Jews also understood this term to refer to the Son of God, Luke, the 22nd chapter, verses 66 through 70. As written by Paul in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 15 through 47, he said, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. 
However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is a Lord from heaven. So no matter how blessed you may be, it is still only blessed is the man. You are a man, and the text applies to you with blessed is the man. May it be true of all of us. Uh, let's now consider uh, what the uh, psalmist has to say uh, that the man, the blessed man, avoid. Now, if you want to avoid extra calories, which uh, inevitably collects around the midriff, you avoid sugar and fat. However, that would mean one would have to avoid chicken fried steak, bottled up with a piece of pecan pie, and that's that's just one of the avoidance I tried to avoid. <laughs> Nevertheless, there, there are a plethora of things to be prudently avoided. Now, in this psalm, it appears that the blessed man avoids the common way of ungodly persons. Now, we may have an image of the ungodly as drunks, philanderers, or swears. Uh, these are ungodly, of course, but not all ungodly persons are like them. The ungodly can be just uh, your everyday sort of, of uh, people. They may go to church or go to the bars, kiss their wives or beat their wives, pat their dogs or kick their dogs. They are often very respectable, good neighbors, kind to the poor. They may hold public office or enter Congress, however odious that may be. There is no place they may not feel, for it is not considered an offense among men to be ungodly. The tragic folly and sin of these people is that they have neglected the chief thing to be remembered, namely that there is a God, and that they are his creatures, and being his creatures, ought to live in obedience to him, and will in due time appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. But they give God no part of their lives, and he is in none of their thoughts. They will think of their neighbors, remember their friends and acquaintances, and chip in now and then to some charitable cause. But God is not in their thoughts. But there is coming a great and glorious day in which God will be in their thoughts. Romans the 14th chapter verse 11 and Philippians the 2nd chapter verse 10. The blessed man, however, avoids this. He sees that God, who fills all things, ought to fill his thoughts, and that the great end of his being should be, as Paul says, to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. 1 Corinthians the 6th chapter verse 20. It is chiefly here that the godly man differs from others. He does not consider first how the world regards a thing, but how God looks at it. <clears throat> if they ask, is it fashionable? He replies, the fashion of this world passes away, 1 John 2nd chapter, verses 15 through 17. But will you gain by it, some ask? And he says, I am not looking merely for earthly gain. I am content to lose so that I can keep my word and serve God. The first thought of the truly blessed man is how he can best glorify the name of Christ. And in so doing, he avoids the counsel of the ungodly. <clears throat> Next, he avoids the path, path of sinners. Sinners live for pleasures. The Christian has his own set of pleasures, but these pleasures would never please the worldly, nor would the, would the worldly gratify his new taste in his Christian pleasures. The sinner can do a thousand things that the uh, saint cannot do, and would not do if he could. And the Christian can do a thousand things of which the sinner knows nothing. They let a thing be labeled sin in God's book, and though men may laugh at it, call it a mere joke, a trivial thing uh, of no concern, 
A godly man accepts God's enlightening of it and lets the path of sinners remain untrodden. The faithful Christian shuns the seat of the scornful. It makes his blood boil when he hears God's name profaned. His heart is full of horror because of the wicked who obey not God's law. He is told to prove or test all things, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And even a very slight test is enough to prove some things that need to be put aside quickly. Those things put to the test and proved to be good, he will hold fast regardless of outside influence. Many a seed has been taken near the seed of the scornful in disregard to the influence such proximity may have. Eve took her seat next to the serpent and ruined the whole world by listening to the serpent's suggestion. And much mischief has been done in similar in a similar way since then to uh, and since then to Christian faith and simplicity. The further a man can get from the scorner's seat, the better. And there let him sit alone, just leave him there. The day will come when, uh, like Korah, Dathan, and Byram, the profane shall go down into the pit. Happy is the man who shall escape that horror by keeping far, far away. These are some of the things the truly blessed man avoids. The more he avoids them, the more blessed he is. Once more, he avoids the very person of sinners, except to the extent that he must deal with them in civil matters and the common courtesies and duties of life. They are not his bosom friends. He would never dream of being unequally yoked with them. He shuns their company all he can, for he has congenial associates elsewhere. Their ways, examples, words he avoids, as he would keep social distancing from plague-infected places and people. He strives to keep aloof from men who blaspheme, lest their profanity should taint and defile him. Keep in mind that uh, cool ashes from the fireplace will not burn, but they will blacken. Bad company can blacken even where it does not burn, so stay away from it. You can never retain this blessedness of man, the man described here, unless you walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, stand not in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Well, let's consider a, a third uh, thing about uh, this man, this blessed man. Uh, that is, wherein the blessed man delights. His delight is in the law of the Lord. A man, a man must have some delight, some supreme pleasure. His heart was never meant to be a vacuum. If not filled with the best things, he will be filled with the unworthy and the disappointing. After Jesus had successfully resisted the entreaties of the devil, the scripture says, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So there is always something there. That's from Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse 11. Nature and man abhor a vacuum. Man will be filled with good or evil. If you do not fill the measure with wheat, the arch enemy will fill it with chaff. If the river flows not with sparkling sweet water, it will soon reek with pollution. Take care to have something worthy to delight in. As Paul wrote in Philippians the fourth chapter verse eight, finally brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things or a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. <clears throat> if indeed we meditate on these things, we will delight in them, for they are from the Lord. <clears throat> As the psalmist said, delight yourself also in the Lord, 
and he shall give you the desires of your heart. <clears throat> 37th Psalm, verse 4. Unfortunately, most take their religion as men do medicine, with their noses turned up. Some folks go to assemble with the saints, as you might suppose criminals would go to the chain gang. Like a homesick child going home, so should it be a blessing uh, for those assembling with the saints. The true Christian has his holy delights, and chief among them is his reveling in the gospel of Christ, the word of God. Of course, David, uh, when he wrote this psalm, had not a fourth of what we possess. Uh, he was a very little Bible indeed. But it has gone on increasing like a majestic river until it is the wonderful volume that we have now. Even the first Christians had not what we have. We, therefore, should take ten times more delight in this volume of ours than did the psalmist or any contemporary of Paul's. Why do Christians delight in it? because it is the gospel, the good news of Christ, God's power to save, Romans 1.16. Anything belong, belonging to God should delight the believer. We delight in it because it comes with divine authority to us, a message of justification and glorification, and so brings confidence and joy to our hearts. Do you not delight in this book? Not do you read it, but do you read it with the delight? As the psalmist said, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. To go to it dragged there by duty is miserable to miss its best messages, and there's no evidence of true godliness. To put a sentence of it under the tongue is as a sweet morsel. As the psalmist said, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The 119th Psalm, verse 103. To grow healthy upon it when you're sick, rich upon it when you're when poor, this is one of the truest tests of being a blessed man. But if you do not delight in this, you will be miserable. So we have to ask another question. What occupies the blessed man's time? In his law, he meditates day and night. He gets little in intervals of time to read it and moments in, in which to meditate upon it. Each takes away from some other duty or preoccupation. Reading reaps the wheat, but it is meditation that produces the bread. It is not only reading that does us good, but the soul inwardly feeding on it and digesting it. Are there some who do not meditate on God's word at all? <clears throat> if so, then this solemn thought will seize us. If you do not have the blessedness of God's word, you must inherit is cursed. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. Let us then meditate in its law day and night. Now, let's uh, get to the very center of the Psalms teaching. Uh, that is, where is it, uh, wherein is it that this man is so divinely blessed? Uh, very briefly on each point, he is blessed first with life, that is, he shall be like a tree. He's not a dry, dead utility pole. His life is such that the lost are strangers to it. He has been begotten again into a living hope, First Peter 1, verse 3. The sap of God's grace is in him. He is united to Christ, his root. And because Christ lives and lives in him, he lives also. He has stability. The tree is planted. Its roots run deep in the ground. 
The wicked are like the chaff that the wind drives away. But the Christian's life is stable. As the psalmist said, you will show me the path of life in your presence. Uh, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's the 16th Psalm, verse 11. He has, uh, too, the gladness of growth. <clears throat> the tree that is planted uh, does not remain a sapling, but it grows upward and outward, spreading its branches. So the godly man is always learning more of his heavenly father and endeavoring to be more conformed to the image of his Lord Jesus Christ. He has a blessing, too, of a favored position. If he is a faithful servant, he believes God has put him where he should be. Poor rich, he learns to be content for he is a tree divinely planted. He is well sustained. Whatever is good for him, God has pledged himself to give it. He is not a tree planted in the desert, but a place where the water comes rippling up to his roots. He hears his master say, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. 37th Psalm, verse 3. He has yet again beauty in God's sight, beauty of a, an unfading kind, whose leaf shall also shall not wither. When personal beauty decays by reason of old age and wit and learning are assailed by approaching death, still he shall be fair in the likeness of his master as a young olive tree and grow as a cedar in the court of his God. And to top it off, he has constant prosperity and whatever he does shall prosper he may not grow rich but he still prospers he may lose his possessions but he is made, made wealthy in faith and love and sweet submission to God's will this uh, metaphor of the flourishing tree is, is a very beautiful one beautiful one just picture it uh, there as uh, being planted always green, loaded with fruit, uh, standing where it can never no drought. If God has taught us to delight in his law, that is our true picture and portrait. Is it yours? But to close this lesson, uh, we ask, who is this blessed man's guardian? There must be somebody who takes care of him or he could not be so blessed as he is. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. If you're arresting in Christ for salvation, the Lord knows your way like no one else. The Lord knows all your ways. Whatever your troubles may be, pour out your heart to God, for he knows, and he knows how to help. If the Lord did not look after us in our best days, we would perish by the deceitfulness of too much prosperity. Proverbs, the 30th chapter, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> and if he did not watch over us in our worst days, we should be consumed by the cruel winds of adversity. How may I begin this way? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9th chapter, verse 20. And this is the fear of the Lord, to trust your soul in the hands of God's appointed Savior and know you are safe. As the gospel song says, just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me, and that you bid me come to you, O Lamb of God, I come. All the bidding that he may do, ultimately, it is you that must come. Thank you for your kind attention.